Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to U.S. History Through Film. As we look a little bit at the aftermath of the Spanish-American War, which we saw depicted in Rough Riders. Now, besides invading Cuba, as shown in the movie, the U.S. Army also invaded Puerto Rico, where they faced stiff resistance from the Spanish, who would fight small battles and then retreat before they could be captured. However, many, though not all, Puerto Ricans supported the United States they believed were helping them win their independence. And, um, and the U.S. took over Puerto Rico as well. Fighting officially ended between the U.S. and Spain um, on August 12, 1898, and actually ended slightly after that. A peace treaty went into effect on April 11, 1899, almost precisely one year after war had been declared. And this made the United States into an empire. John Hay, uh, America's Secretary of State, described the Spanish-American War as a splendid little war. In many ways it was. The United States lost fewer than 400 soldiers killed in battle, although more than 5,000 died of disease. The United States gained Puerto Rico, which we still have, and Guam, which we still have, and the Philippines, where the U.S. Army had to fight a long, hard war against the Filipinos, who had thought they were fighting for their independence from Spain and the complete independence. Cuba was made an independent country, but one in which the United States retained the right to intervene whenever necessary, necessity being defined by the United States. The United States also retained a perpetual lease on the naval base we established at Guantanamo Bay in Cuba, which we occupy to this day. And in the United States, this splendid little war reinforced Americans' opinions favoring a strong navy, which continued to expand in the early 1900s. It also forced improvements in the organization of the Army and U.S. government regulation of the National Guard. It helped to reunite Northerners and Southerners after the Civil War, and it turned Theodore Roosevelt into a national hero. And his fame as a leader of Rough Riders would soon um, help him become governor of New York, vice president, um, and not long afterwards, um, president in his own right. But some Americans were opposed to keeping these new colonies. Um, many of those opponents of becoming an empire formed the Anti-Imperialist League in 1898. Today, its most famous member is probably Mark Twain, the great author, um, who was one of its founders and served as its vice president from 1901 to 1910. But um, a number of other prominent members, um, for various reasons. Mark Twain believed it was simply hypocritical um, and indeed cruel in some cases for the U.S. to have an empire of our own. Um, Samuel Gompers, um, the great labor leader, was a member. He feared um, competition for America's working class um, from uh, in the addition of, uh, of poor and unskilled workers in colonies. Uh, Andrew Carnegie, the famous businessman, um, was opposed to this on moral grounds. Um, indeed, he was opposed to all war. Former President um, Grover Cleveland believed and this was immoral and, uh, and worried about changes to the composition of America's population and exposure um, to war with other empires. Um, the reformer Jane Addams and founder of the Settlement House, Hull House, um, worried it would be difficult to assimilate these, uh, these new peoples into American culture. But as famous as, and prominent as all these people were in their day, and to some extent still are, um, probably the most influential of all at the time was William Jennings Bryan, who, uh, who had run for president unsuccessfully based on his economic policy of free silver in 1896. In 1900 would make anti-imperialism part of his platform in a second unsuccessful attempt at the presidency. He was unable, though, to defeat um, William McKinley and his running mate, um, Theodore Roosevelt, the great war hero. Most Americans were proud of uh, the victory in the war, which did make America very clearly uh, a major world power. But 
The anti-imperialists did win one victory in Congress. When the U.S. declared war on Spain, anti-imperialists inserted the Teller Amendment into that declaration. And this amendment um, guaranteed Cuba, at least, would not be annexed to the United States if conquered. And Cuba did remain an independent republic, but when Congress passed another law pulling American troops out of Cuba in 1902, that law was amended by the Platt Amendment, in which the United States um, specifically retained the right to intervene in Cuban foreign and domestic affairs whenever necessary. Um, if they ever needed help, the United States could send it. Um, it would be the U.S. who determined if they needed help. And by help, I usually mean the Marine Corps. The uh, main points were protection of American property in Cuba and preferential trade agreements between the two countries. Um, and uh, to enforce this, the U.S. would send Marines into Cuba several times, um, provoking resentment in Cuba. And, of course, the Philippines had been easier to conquer than to occupy. During the Spanish-American War, Emilio Aguinaldo um, had led Philippine guerrillas against the Spanish, um, under the belief the U.S. would support Philippine independence once the Spanish were driven out. And when the Spanish surrendered, Aguinaldo helped to create a Philippine Republic and was chosen as its first president. But the United States did not recognize the Philippine Declaration of Independence, and soon fighting broke out in what's often known as the Philippine Insurrection or the Philippine-American War. Some fighting began in 1898. Um, the uprising began seriously in 1899. And many Americans who had just fought in Cuba now went to fight in the Philippines. Black Jack Pershing would serve in the Philippines, as would Fred Funston uh, and Joe Wheeler. Um, the Filipinos fought a guerrilla war, attacking out of the jungles and out of villages, often hitting the U.S. Army behind our own lines. The U.S. responded um, with equal cruelty under the command of military governor General Arthur MacArthur, a decorated Civil War veteran. And during the Philippine insurrection, both sides fought in the most brutal fashion they could, including torturing prisoners. You don't want to be captured by the Filipinos. They might bury you alive, or almost bury you alive, up to your neck in an anthill to be slowly devoured, or tied to a tree next to an anthill with your stomach cut open and marmalade spread on your exposed bowels. The ants would eat the marmalade, then your intestines, and then work in from there. Some American soldiers were castrated and removed parts stuffed into their mouths so they would not die of pain or shock um, or blood loss. They would die of suffocation on themselves. Some were released after first being exposed to other prisoners known to have leprosy or other diseases in the hopes they would spread those diseases to their comrades. Spanish priests who often supported the U.S. control. The Philippines were sometimes mutilated right in front of their own congregations in the church, as did other Filipinos who refused to support the insurrection. Now, American soldiers often simply shot surrendering Filipinos, or sometimes gave them the water cure, um, putting a funnel in their mouth and pouring water down their throat until their stomachs or their bladders burst. Um, other Filipinos, both guerrillas and civilians, were placed in concentration camps, as the Spanish had done in Cuba and the British had done to the Boers in South Africa even earlier. A few American officers were eventually tried in courts martial for their actions. Many captured Filipino leaders were executed, um, and executed in a Spanish style, which is to say they were strangled to death with a rope. But many perpetrators of war crimes on both sides went unpunished. Many Americans felt the role of the U.S. and the Philippines should be to civilize the local people, to teach them English, to end the role of the Catholic Church and the government, to convert the large Muslim population in the southern part of the Philippines to Christianity, and generally to make the Philippines as much like America and Europe as possible, a duty some described as taking up the white man's burden, based on a poem by Rudyard Kipling. 
Among the many Americans who went to the Philippines to serve as teachers was Henry Nash, a um, Spanish-American war veteran from the Rough Riders who became superintendent of schools um, in Maccabee in 1902, um, although he had died not long afterwards of a cerebral hemorrhage on July 5th, 1902. But American teachers in the Philippines did build a very strong school system in those islands. Emilio Aguinaldo was captured in 1901 and only allowed to go free after swearing loyalty to the U.S. and asking his followers to stop fighting, um, although he did not entirely mean his loyalty. Uh, during World War II, for a time, he supported the Japanese against the United States in the Philippines. Still, when he asked his followers to surrender um, at this time, most did stop fighting. The majority of fighting in the Philippine insurrection came to an end in 1902, although in some more remote areas, violence lasted at least until 1913, particularly in the Muslim parts of the southern Philippines, um, where there had already been um, a movement for independence based um, on religion as well, a movement that continues in some parts of the southern Philippines. Um, over 5,000 Americans died in the Philippine insurrection, and more than 200,000 Filipinos were killed. Now, one reason violence did decrease is that eventually the very harsh governor, Arthur MacArthur, was replaced by a new civilian governor of the Philippines, William Howard Taft, who treated the Filipinos with much greater respect, uh, inviting um, prominent local Filipinos to dine in the governor's mansion with his family, for example. He even allowed some self-government to the Philippines, although he could remain strict in some areas, limiting, for example, the freedom of the press, sometimes even imprisoning people who protested against American rule. Um, and while he tried to take care of the Filipinos and was generally uh, loved by them, he still did view them as, in his words, our little brown brothers who needed to be lifted up and protected. But still better a little brown brother, perhaps, than cross-eyed khaki-colored uh, khaki thieves, as some American soldiers had referred to the Filipinos um, during the insurrection. In 1906, the Jones Act promised that the Philippines could eventually have their independence, which was fully granted in uh, 1946, right up to the end of World War II, all the U.S. would continue to keep military bases in the Philippines for years afterwards, and to this day has strong, if not always perfect, relations with the Philippine Republic. And Emilio Aguinaldo did live to see Philippine independence in 1946, and even spent a short time in a largely ceremonial role um, in the Filipino government. So, but despite these difficulties, by the beginning of the 20th century, the United States was an imperial power to match any of the ancient empires of Europe.